we're, we're going to shift now to a, a more celebratory note uh, after hearing both the, the possible benefits but also some of the risks and concerns. Uh, shift to a celebration uh, through the awarding of two professorships as part of the KNL Gates Endowment in Ethics and Computational Technologies. Uh, chaired professorships are, are some of the highest honors that can be awarded upon a faculty member, and they recognize their excellence in education, in research, in outreach, and in all the things that are key to uh, faculty members' role within the broader university. And I think in particular in this case, um, I wanted to read a, a quote from our very own Herb Simon, who made several appearances in the keynote, uh, which is, he said in 2000, we are not observers of the future, we are actors who, whether we wish to or not, by our actions and our very existence, will determine the future's shape. Technology must be evaluated by its ability to help us, or hinder us, in pursuing our goals, not by the flashing lights that it enables us to produce. And I think one of the things that really binds together uh, both of the recipients of professorships that we're gonna be awarding tonight is that they both very much have looked at how we can use technology, not just for the flashing lights that it produces, not just for the pretty uh, ROC curves that we can plot in our paper that we give at a conference, but how it can actually help humans advance and their own goals and interests. Um, so I'm now delighted to uh, welcome Dr. Lori Weingart, who is the interim provost of Carnegie Mellon and the Richard M. and Margaret S. Seyert Professor of Organizational Behavior and Therapy in the Tepper School of Business. Uh, Lori is a nationally and internationally recognized scholar on group processes, conflict management, and negotiation. She's been a member of the CMU faculty since 1989 and previously served as the asso senior associate dean uh, for education at the Tepper School. As interim provost at Carnegie Mellon, she's responsible for leading CMU's schools, colleges, institutes, and campuses, and has been instrumental in the institutional and academic planning and implementation. Lori, thank you. Well, thank you, David, for the introduction. Um, you just turned me into a therapist, which sometimes I feel like is a daily part of my job. Uh, okay, so um, I want to thank also Eric for wonderful comments we had today. Very insightful. And as a professor of organizational behavior and theory, um, I think a lot about these issues in terms of how we interact with technology in the workforce and what impact that will have. So I do want to ask everyone to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, we have two amazing faculty that we're gonna recognize. But before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge the pivotal role that KNL Gates has played in putting this conference together and of course partnering with Carnegie Mellon. So for that, I'd like to um, invite Jim Segerdahl, global managing partner of KNL Gates, to the stage to join me to receive a token of our appreciation and share a few thoughts. And while I'm not gonna hand over the token right now, what you see over here is a, very, a mini chair so that was produced by our DFAB lab, 3D printing, um, as a replica of our larger professorship chairs. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And I, I uh, humbly and uh, with much appreciation on behalf of all of my colleagues at KNL Gates, thank you for the gift and for the token. Uh, we're just uh, thrilled and excited to be part of this. You know, an, an initiative like this really depends on outstanding institutions, outstanding institutional support, but ultimately it comes down to outstanding people. Outstanding people with a vision, outstanding people with the energy, the drive, the intellectual curiosity to move important things forward. Uh, and I think that's characteristic of, of the uh, uh, professorships that have been awarded. Uh, here uh, uh, as part of the Kano Gates Endowment, and we couldn't be prouder uh, to be a part of that and to be supporting that. We'll hear from them. Uh, I want to congratulate them personally and all the Kano Gates fellows, uh, and thank again uh, CMU for being a great partner to us and for uh, its uh, uh, incredible role in driving forward these important issues. So thank you again.
Okay, now it's time to celebrate two faculty members who have the distinction of becoming the first K&L Gates professor, professors of ethics and computational technologies here at Carnegie Mellon. So to introduce the first chair recipient will be Dean Dan Martin, who's Dean of the College of Fine Arts. Dan joined Carnegie Mellon faculty in 1992 to direct the Master of Arts Management Program and later served as director of the Institute of the Management of Creative Enterprises. Over the subsequent 20 odd years or so, he founded a number of innovative programs here at Carnegie Mellon, including the Center for Arts Management and Technology and the Master of Entertainment Industry Management. Prior to his higher education career, Dan spent several years working in arts management in New York, Philadelphia, Norfolk, Virginia, Akron, Ohio, and Kalamazoo, Michigan. So we're certainly privileged to have Dean, uh, Dean Dan as part of our Carnegie Mellon family. So please welcome Dean Dan Martin. Thank you again, Laurie. And on behalf of the College of Fine Arts, I extend our welcome to all of you. And to Molly, I offer our heartfelt congratulations. I'm honored to formally and officially present you to the campus community as the first K&L Gates Career Development Professor of Ethics and Computational Technologies. As you may, have know, as you may know from reading Molly's biography, she has an esteemed reputation as a multifaceted uh, professional. I'll get the words out, I'll slow down, I promise. A designer, author, professor, speaker, and uh, architectural historian. Her research focuses on the impact of artificial intelligence in the design and architectural domains, and she's put that knowledge to practice in her work within both the School of Design and the School of Architecture in the College of Fine Arts at Carnegie Mellon. In her book, Architectural Intelligence, How Designers and Architects Created the Digital Landscape, Molly approaches architecture in a different light, focusing on design processes and tools, computer programs, interfaces, and digital environments. The book highlights four architects whose work in the 60s and 70s significantly influenced digital design in the industry over the last four decades. These projects from a half century ago led to so many of our contemporary interactive practices, from information architecture to interaction design, and from machine learning to smart cities. Molly's credentials are impressive. She holds a master's degree in environmental design from the Yale School of Architecture and a doctorate in architecture from Princeton. She's in very high demand as a keynote speaker, both nationally and internationally. She's been called a web pioneer and, professional, and her professional experience includes engagements at both groundbreaking design studios and Fortune 500 companies. Prior to joining Carnegie Mellon in 2015, Molly taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and in Italy's Interaction Design Institute, Ivrea. We are fortunate to have Molly with us, and we are so very grateful to K&L Gates for its recognition of Molly's work. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Molly Wright Steenson, the new K&L Gates Development Professor of Ethics and Computational <laughs> Technologies. <laughs> Congratulations, Molly. Thank you Molly. so much. Thank you. So let me start by saying that I am so pleased and honored to be the first recipient of the K&L Gates Associate Professorship in Ethics and Computational Technologies. And I want to thank K&L Gates for the generous com contribution that has made this award possible. So as I'm standing here, you might be wondering, why is a design professor standing up here? And what do design and architecture, and for that matter, history, have to do with ethics and computation? Architecture and design meet us where we live. Architects and designers create the world that we live in, and pioneers in computation, artificial intelligence, and cybernetics have long reached out to architecture and design to help them talk about the implications of their technologies and their innovations. For instance, computing pioneer Douglas Engelbart proposed the augmented human intellect system in 1962. In his proposal, 
Engelbart used an architect to show his vision of computing at scale. I think that Engelbart understood something vital about the power of computers and architecture, both, that they are about building worlds. And today, more than ever, computation is about building worlds. And we expect more from these worlds. And design is vital for this task. Designers don't only make attractive products and services. Designers frame problems. They frame problems so that we can solve them and ask questions. Designers create elegant products and interfaces. Design plays an important role in the kinds of open world challenges that we were just hearing about. And designers contribute to creating systems that are safe and fair. I'm looking forward to using the K&L Gates Associate Professorship in Ethics and Computational Technologies to support questions about the role of design and ethics in computation. And I'm eager to forge new pathways into the intersections of AI and design and architecture. As Dean Martin noted, my work for the last decade has been about forging that history. I'm now looking forward to forging its future. I look forward to bringing this work to new audiences so they might better understand the ramifications of technology and better understand the ethics and computation, ethics of computation in our everyday lives. I have many people that I'd like to thank. First, of course, I'd like to thank um, Interim Provost Lori Weingart um, for this chair. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Terry Irwin, the head of the School of Design, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. I first met Terry almost 20 years ago when I worked with her at her company, Meta Design, and it was an introduction to a sophisticated way of design and design thinking that I have been chasing ever since. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the School of Design who broaden and deepen my horizons. I'm grateful for their inspiration. And I'd also like to thank Steve Lee and my colleagues in the School of Architecture. I owe much to the students who I work with, from undergraduates to masters, to the doctor, doctoral students I advise, one of whom just handed in her dissertation today and is here, and who I will see defend in the weeks to come. Thank you for what you teach me. I'd like to thank Dean Dan Martin for his recognition and his support, and for seeing across the horizons of the College of Fine Arts to the many possibilities of what the arts can do at a university such as this one, and out into the world beyond. I'm thrilled for the opportunity to build bridges across campus, and I wish to express my gratitude with some of the people who helped me to do that, who include Golan Levin, Jody Forlesi, and John Zimmerman. I want to extend a very special thank you to David Danks for being a kindred spirit and a fellow traveler in pursuit of these important questions, and a very special thank you to the dear friends and collaborators here at CMU who fuel so many brilliant ideas and so much creative energy. You make it so exciting to be here. Finally, my husband, Simon King, deserves all of my love and gratitude. He's been a tremendous support in helping me see this work out into the world, and not to mention seeing me through surgery on a broken hand. Thank you, Simon King. I love you. And finally, thank you again to k &L Gates for this chair. And next, and next we have uh, Dean Andrew Moore to introduce the second k &L Gates professor. Andrew Moore joined our faculty in 1993 and famously took a leave of absence, that's what he's known for, leaving Carnegie Mellon uh, in 2006 to open Google's Pittsburgh office. With Andrew at its helm, Google Pittsburgh grew from two to 275 employees and now anchors. 140,000 square foot bakery square development just a few miles from campus. He returned to CMU in 2014 to serve as Dean of the School of Computer Science and we're certainly the better for it. Uh, now, if you please welcome to the stage, Dean Andrew Moore. Uh, I'm so excited to see everyone here today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I want to congratulate Molly. Uh, I think we're all super excited uh, that you've been recognized in this way. And thank you very much for being such a person who reaches across campus. Uh, I also uh, want to thank Eric Horvitz uh, for coming here and taking part. And that discussion with David was brilliant. I was like in the back sort of cheering along. That was fantastic. Uh, and Canel Gates, thank you very much. As you see, we 
at Carnegie Mellon right now are in a period where by chance or by decades of planning, we have faculty who are figuring out what happens next for the technological society we're gonna live in. And retaining and recognizing those faculty is critically important. And these kinds of professorships uh, are exactly what we need right now. So your, your, uh, the creation of these professorships is disproportionately important, I think, for helping an institution which itself is helping the world. So that's all good. Now I have to talk about Ila Norbash, uh, the uh, recipient of the first KNL Gates professorship. And what I basically have to say is this is clearly an awful mistake. <laughs> Ila has been the bane of my life for years. <laughs> I had to share an office next, well, not share an office, I was in an office next to Ila for about eight years of my career. And here's a typical thing, the way life would be. I'm sitting with one of my grad students really worried. It's like, if we don't get the, sec the ratio of the second and third eigenvalue below one minus lambda, you know, we're completely screwed. And then Ila would bounce past the open door on an artificially intelligent poco stick, <laughs> shrieking. And then two weeks later, we'd be like, uh, oh God, and these asteroids, if they, if we don't get the, their correct detection, they're going to hit the Earth at some point soon. And then Ila would be rushing past with a bunch of kids who are chasing some escaped mobile robot. So this is exactly the way Ila is. Uh, not actually a pain in the butt, but someone who has brought real joy and passion and focus and motivation to the study of advanced technology. Throughout his career, which began at NASA, uh, involved some seminal work on scheduling and optimization, which turned into a very successful uh, startup company. Uh, carrying on with the work that he's done on educational robotics and really making it so that folks outside the normal walk of life of people at Carnegie Mellon get to see the absolute joy of combining the physical world with algorithms. And then going on to things like the invention of the Gigapan, this amazing notion of a virtual ultra high resolution camera, which uh, has uh, shown us a whole different view of the world. And inside that you see the things which make Carnegie Mellon in general, but Ela as the perfect representative of this, so perfect. It's wonderful from an artistic and design point of view. Inside it, it is really complicated to actually make it so that you can uh, stitch together so many images in a way that looks beautiful. And so I bet that actually during that period of time, Ela was actually having to worry about the second and third eigenvalues of some matrices, just like he ought to. So that's good. And then sort of moving on from that, Ela has in the past decade, uh, I think been a leader in how computer science should be practiced by people who care about the future of the world. And Ila, myself, Eric, uh, many other people, David, uh, many other people in this audience, we're often on panels and discussions of technology impact. And so often I hear people sort of leaning back and saying, yeah, someone should do this, or it should be done this way, or governments should do such and such. And while we're sitting on our comfy chairs talking, Ila and the Create Lab are actually building stuff. If we're complaining about air quality, he's building stuff technologically to help give real accountability to folks who are polluting and help uh, individuals understand when they're in danger. When it comes to these big questions such as deforestation, instead of just saying it's a bad thing, he has successfully harnessed uh, the massive infrastructure used for world map building to make folks accountable for this. And all the time, as he's guiding his students and people going through the Create Lab, he's uh, peeling off, if you like, dozens every year of students and co-workers who go out and do the same sort of thing. This is my favorite kind of ethical computer scientist. 
the kind who actually does something about it. And it, with that, I uh, uh, strongly congratulate Ila for his uh, uh, award. Well, that was one hell of an introduction. Thank you, Andrew. Um, what I want to do is talk a little bit, well, let me back up. I've, I've been in Pittsburgh for two decades. Um, actually, I was here three decades ago because my brother was at San Francis Medical Center, which doesn't exist, but the old timers here know it. And that means I was here when the O was the only place to eat anything. Um, this is a long time ago. I've seen a lot of changes here. And as Carnegie Mellon and Pittsburgh have changed, and I've been just wondrously witnessing that, there is one thing that is very special, which is that Carnegie Mellon and Pittsburgh are the only places for the kind of work that I wish to do. There is nowhere else that this work can happen. And I want to just give you a few minutes on explaining why that is by talking about some of the stakeholders. And I really mean it. This is not pandering to CMU or Pittsburgh. This is what makes this place utterly unique. First of all, students. I was blessed when I got here negotiating a deal where I teach experimental classes, interdisciplinary classes, classes that push on the boundaries of what we normally consider a class. And in all those classes, the students at Carnegie Mellon have blown me away because they are not students that sit in the classes and take the classes. They're students that sit there and then make the class. They take control and they create an agenda that creates fantastic learning between all of them and me. And that attitude is something I saw peak here during the second Gulf War. And then a whole lot of startup companies started and the student attitude went away, the ethics went away. Some people even left and went to places like Google for a few years, but they came back. <laughs> and then what happened is just in the last four years, I've seen an exponential increase in the degree of social awareness our students have. They're demanding interdisciplinary education. They're demanding that their classes connect them to real social outcomes and give them a considered way in which to change the world, to bend the arc of the future for the better. So to me, those students are incredible that way. Um, and my hats are off to them for inventing the space in which we can invent new classes like AI and Humanity, which thanks to Dean Moore and the Dean of the College of Humanities, enabled cross-college learning across humanities students and computer science students at the same time. But then there's the staff, and this is where things get a little bit unusual, I think. Usually you have your administrative staff who help you with things like financials, fundraising, and room scheduling. But we have a staff in the Robotics Institute that have had luncheons where I've talked about the research I do, and then they've had long-standing opportunities where they come and talk to me about the research that we do and connect us to groups with which I can do that research, community empowerment with technology. So the staff are intellectual peers to us here and I think that's very, very rare to see because they're often treated in the wrong way at universities. And of course, in that same staff category, I have to put the entire Create Lab because um, it's fine to talk about me inventing all these technologies, but in fact, in fact, what I mostly do is called fundraising. It is the Create Lab, 30 people who consider how they can have positive impact on the world that then go out and invent systems that we can all be proud of. Then there's faculty, and this is where things get interesting. Because when I came to Carnegie Mellon, it was, I believe, quite clear that you succeed by having disciplinary depth in a single discipline. And the sea change that I've seen in the time that I've been here is that in fact we, as a faculty, are willing now to reward boundary work. We're willing to give tenure to somebody, not because they're the number one expert in a single discipline, but because they have found a new way of tying together across transdisciplinary boundaries something that has important human impact. And that makes this a more human university than it could ever have been before. And that change in faculty attitude means we take more risks and are more willing to accept challenges that are almost impossible to achieve. Now I want to go to the city, because the city is equally special. Um, I had the benefit of trying to fundraise in San Francisco for a few years, both during three sabbaticals there and before I became faculty here. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of money there, but because there's so much money there, the foundation community there supports the fads. They support the digital badges. They support the programs that are quantitative, that have metric outcomes, and that don't cause real change, but rather incremental change. 
And here you have a set of foundations who are actually driven by the four Ps that the mayor uh, announced this morning. They're driven by equity and by the idea of inclusion of all the communities in Pittsburgh. So you have an entire foundation class here, as big as the one in New York City for a smaller city, that actually cares deeply about social welfare, and this is the trick, is willing to invest obscene amounts of money in technological innovation because they understand how technological innovation can cause social welfare. You will not find that in any other city in our union. And then we can go to the community-based organizations, the Ag Allegheny County Clean Air Now, the Group Against Smog and Pollution, and dozens of other institutions like Clean Water Action that work with us directly hand-to-hand -hand every day. We, the university, have won their trust and support because we don't parachute in and then leave. We come into a community and we stay there for decades at a time. And that's something I challenge you to find elsewhere. Finally, this is not the good news, but it's real. There's the community itself. Pittsburgh, the fabric of Pittsburgh. When you look at Pittsburgh, you can see great success in the last decade or so, massive success. But what you see, in fact, is one of the worst race disparities in the United States, one of the larger inequities in wealth in the United States, one of the biggest divisions in educational success and deficiency in the United States. We are a crucible for change because we're so horrible as a whole. We're two cities melted together with the barrier that is like a Berlin Wall. And because Pittsburgh is so bad at sharing its wealth, it is the perfect place for us to innovate for social change using technologies like AI. Because this is the place where if we can succeed in bridging the rampant gaps that we have in race and wealth and advantage, then we have a formula, a structure that we owe it to ourselves to apply all over the world. So that makes Pittsburgh and it makes Carnegie Mellon absolutely unique places for the kind of work that we do, the kind of work that I really can't imagine doing anywhere else. Um, in summary, there are too many people to thank, to thank them all, but it is this institution and this city that makes this possible. KNL Gates, you're part of the city. I have been befriending individuals in your organization for years now and I'm deeply indebted and honored and humbled by you. My whole career has been about community empowerment and the way I look at these chairs, and I gotta say I love mini me, I love the mini chair. So if there's a way to swap them, um, we can have that discussion later. The way I look at the chair though, in, in all seriousness, is that it's an obligation that this, which has been my only career and my whole career so far, is going to be my only career. And I hope that I can continue to do the best that's possible with the resources of Pittsburgh and the resources of Carnegie Mellon. So thank you to all. Well, I think you can see from our two chair recipients the breadth and the depth of knowledge that we're bringing to bear and setting the intersection between artificial intelligence, computational technologies, and ethics. So with that, please join me in congratulating our two chair recipients. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for our keynote and for our chair professorship ceremony. Please join us for a reception in the back of the room to honor our recipients. Thank you.